When was the last time you put an ice cube in a glass of water? It probably wasn't that hard to do. But over 100 years ago, if you wanted ice, it had to have been winter. It had to have been cold enough for water to freeze. Then someone had to actually cut out that piece of ice from a frozen body of water and deliver it on a horse-pulled sled before it melted. Then a breakthrough technology was invented known as refrigeration. But it was first applied to giant commercial facilities known as ice factories. Ice became available year-round, independent of the season, and could be delivered faster and more reliably than ever before. However, the innovation did not stop here. Companies in the ice industry went from selling ice to selling personal ice factories, otherwise known as refrigerators. And although a majority of Americans now own a refrigerator, the skepticism was very real at the time. So they asked, why would I ever spend $10,000 adjusting for inflation on this appliance when I could buy thousands of blocks of ice for that same amount of money? I think we all know what the market ultimately favored. Maybe that first time we cut out that piece of ice from that frozen body of water, it felt painful. But over time, this process became normal, and we became numb to its flawed design. When innovation finally occurred, it's very easy to look back and wonder why we didn't invent the refrigerator sooner. Agriculture is in a similar stage to that of the ice industry over 100 years ago. Climate conditions have to be just right. Then a farmer has to harvest all of that produce and deliver it to the end consumer to eat before it perishes. We've become so numb to the design problems associated with farming fresh produce that we've neglected to solve the root problem while wrongfully focusing on finding ways to create better pesticides and preservatives. Today, I'm going to tell you how I discovered the flawed design of agriculture and how personal farming appliances are going to reinvent agriculture in the 21st century. It all started the summer before my senior year at Purdue University. I was given an internship offer to build Section 8 government housing in El Paso, Texas, along the border to Juarez, Mexico, for low-income families. My eyes were open to a sobering reality while working along the border. The city of El Paso is a desert in more ways than one. It's also a food desert. A food desert is whenever a low-income, inner-city area is so far away from a grocery store with fresh produce that the residents are forced to resort to fast food for almost every meal. And the result? Higher obesity rates and health complications. So I began to ask myself, why do food deserts exist? The simple answer is that a low-income area is not a profitable place to run a business such as a grocery store. However, the root reason is much more complex. Produce is very expensive in terms of resource consumption. Produce at the grocery store has lost over half of its nutritional value just the first few days after harvest. This causes Americans to throw away 40% of all the food that's grown in this country because it simply spoils before we can eat it. And what's alarming about 40% is that we're growing plenty of food. We're producing at capacity, but we're failing to deliver it before it perishes because food goes bad over time. The more I asked why these food deserts were appearing in inner city areas, I realized that we were just hitting the tip of an iceberg. This is a warning sign that our global food output is reaching its maximum limit as the available inputs of land and water are diminishing. According to the United Nations, there's going to be 9.7 billion people on this planet in the year 2050, meaning that if we're going to feed the next 3 billion people, we need to effectively increase our global food output by 70%. That's going to be extremely difficult to increase anything by 70% when farming in the US already counts for 50% of our land use. 80% of our freshwater consumption and 70% of our freshwater contamination through the runoff of fertilizers and pesticides. Despite the unfortunate reality that we urgently need a new approach to reinvent agriculture, there is already a viable solution, and that's hydroponics. 
Hydroponics is an advanced form of growing plants without any dirt, using only nutrient-rich water recycled continuously over the roots. Most hydroponic systems are grown indoors, meaning they can produce crops year-round, independent of the season, and they use 95% less water and no pesticides. At this point in time, I knew that there was a food crisis looming, and the food deserts plaguing our inner city areas might be the only warning sign we have before a global food crisis unfolded. It was obvious that conventional farming techniques assumed that water was a limitless resource when this simply wasn't true. I knew that indoor hydroponic farming was the solution for commercial agriculture, but the question then became, would this solution be great enough to feed the predicted 9.7 billion people in the year 2050? Before we look into the future of agriculture, it would be fitting to first take a step back. Much like ice industry, farming has been historically limited to whenever the climate allows it, and the farmer must deliver that produce before it perishes to the end consumer, which requires huge amounts of land, time, and water. Farming 2.0 has been defined as hydroponic farming factories, which parallels the innovations of the ice factories within the ice industry. Advances in LED lighting efficiency have made indoor farming factories financially viable for the first time ever. They can harvest produce year-round, independent of the season, or the availability of vast amounts of land and water. However efficient these farming factories may be in water conservation, they're very expensive to operate due to energy consumption for indoor lighting. Additionally, they fail to solve the core problem with food, and that's that food still goes bad over time. Farming 3.0 will be defined as hydroponic appliances inside of consumers' homes that grows all of your favorite produce in the convenience of your kitchen by keeping produce alive continuously until the moment the user is ready to eat it, we've eliminated food waste while maximizing nutritional content and taste. So we've created the Heloponics Grow Pod. Even though it's the size of a dishwasher, it has high enough yields to generate a full head of leafy greens on a daily basis. With less power consumption than conventional farming, and it's self-cleaning, ensuring the highest degree of food safety. We have fundamentally shifted the way we obtain produce by converting expensive, highly perishable goods into inexpensive, non-perishable seed pods. And although these might look similar to a Keurig K-cup you might already use on a daily basis, each seed pod is pre-programmed with the exact growing conditions you need to grow, so anybody can grow without the labor or the knowledge. As far-fetched as this may sound, the grow pod will have the potential to learn from your feedback. Let's say you eat a head of lettuce out of the system and you decide it was just a little bit too bitter for your specific taste preference. Your grow pod will tell you, sorry, it won't happen again and it will actually incorporate your feedback, change the next growing conditions, and give you sweeter lettuce next time you eat out of it, meaning it will taste better every time you eat out of it, and it learns more about you. Perspective is very important when you're founding a company. When most people overlooked food deserts as a lost cause, we decided we would design a solution in my college apartment that could be scaled to every kitchen in the world. I'm predicting that in the next 30 years, the world's largest farming company will own no land. If we don't invest in indoor agriculture now, the year 2050 will be very bleak. So we at Heloponics would like to ask you all to join us in making our future a little bit brighter. Thank you. <laughs>